the different purposes, I would say, of yoga and by extension, asana in the place, in the role that asana has had in the history of yoga. So, you know, in the beginning, it, without doubt, the yoga was the purpose of yoga and whether it be asana or meditation or both was to connect with God. And so there's this layer there of spirituality versus religion that, you know, I just kind of want to set the groundwork on before we begin this series up with Jen in that what is the difference and uh, what does it mean? I've definitely had practitioners come to edge uh, of different faiths and express concern that the history of yoga implies, um, you know, religion or a cult or, you know, something along those natures and could even go as far as defying their current belief system. And so for that reason, early on, I would say that I detached the religious piece from um, anything offered at EDGE and instead found different verbiage to invite these ideas in based on the individual's practice and, you know, whether or not they subscribe to a structured, organized religion or not, like whatever whatever it is like whatever your jam is you get to have your jam other people get to have their jam that's the beauty of the whole thing uh, but initially asana and the, the whole idea behind it is the the word asana actually asan in sanskrit that a is actually silent but who knows what that means so we we pronounce it uh, means a comfortable seat for meditation so that's the idea the idea behind and it all started asana all started in order to prepare the body for meditation so that it could it could connect with god so just kind of putting those those pieces together for you uh, if we go into the history of yoga in the language and sanskrit and where this comes from <clears throat> it is hindu in origin and so you might find, uh, I'll let one last person, uh, you might find that some folks are a little put off about the Sanskrit piece because it's tied to Hindi. And depending on what their belief system is, they may or may not have a problem with this. And so as such, Edge poised to largely offer lessons in your native tongue. So people on this training, we have people from Italy, from Portugal, from Illinois, um, you know, from native other areas such as um, uh, Australia and so on. And so as such, it's really important to convey that you may not speak in English. In fact, I'd love to run this yoga teacher training in Spanish. So if somebody is so fluent in Spanish that they think they could do it, I want you to send me a message via Slack. I would provide you as much guidance as needed. And the reason is because I feel that's a highly underserved population that doesn't really have access to yoga as much because it's taught in either English or Sanskrit, neither of which is en Espanol. And I took French in high school, so that's not getting me that far. Anyway, so understanding that when your practitioners come to you and they say, you know, I, I, I know that we're speaking Sanskrit, especially not that as much as if you're calling out postures in Sanskrit, but let's say more like let your chanting, if you're chanting in Sanskrit, uh, which is a beautiful practice. And I highly recommend And the idea behind that would be to clear the mind of any word associations that we may have attached to word meanings, you know, um, and truly tap into something um, without those word meanings being attached in Sanskrit would be one benefit. Uh, uh, others scribe to the idea that there's a certain um, frequency, if you will, um, that is attached to the different chants and so on. But that's another lesson. But just kind of weaving it in a little bit. So first thing you want to do, and I'm going to give you a minute to think about it, is I want you to consider what kind of yoga you want to teach. Do you want to teach a, a, a Western yoga? Do you want to teach a, a yoga that honors these Eastern roots? Do you want to teach a hybrid of something? Do you want to find 
maybe you, your background is a whole nother culture and you want to bring in different layers of this and, 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 and bring that into your culture and your customs. And so just take a moment and think, and there's no right or wrong on this. Like from this moment forward, we start to define what the description of our classes will be, whether they be Asana based or not, uh, what, where they'll be guided and where they'll be led. So I want you just to take a moment and put pen to paper and write, I want to lead a blank based class. And so some, Answers could be Eastern, Western, Christian, um, non-denominational, spiritual, non-religious, English, Sanskrit, uh, authentic, like figure out what you want to teach first, and then we're going to bring that idea into moving through this lesson of the history of yoga. So we'll give you two minutes on that idea. Okay, go ahead with that, and I'll, and I'll wait. I'm going to pop a, a chat link here for you guys. Okay, so I popped a link in the chat there for you, and you can definitely go through that and start fine-tuning your Sanskrit. That will be a piece that we start to weave in later in the training. It's, you know, deeper into the phases, so we will be touching on that, um, but we won't go into it terribly deep. I do, I do suggest that if you want to speak Sanskrit, that you take the time and get hooked on phonics and make sure that you're pronouncing it correctly. Um, incorrectly could have different lineages. So your lineages versus the student that comes up to you after class and might say something like, oh, I noticed you said X and I thought it sounded like X, which is it? And you can say, well, I don't know that there's a right or wrong in that. It does depend on lineage. However, I follow X lineage. And that assignment we just did a moment ago is a great time to weave in what lineage you plan on following. So if on your on your assignment there you wrote that you want to teach um, an Eastern modality spiritually based class, if that's what you're looking for, uh, then it would be essential that you spend your time on Sanskrit. If a moment ago you wrote, uh, I want to teach a fitness-based class and I plan on teaching in a gym and I want to I want to reach the, the gym audience, if you will, uh, then I, I don't know that Sanskrit would be the first order of business that I put into place. Not to say I'd never get to it, but I probably wouldn't get to it right away. 
And that's one of the reasons in this training that it unfolds based on what direction you're headed, uh, because it's more important to me to offer you as individuals what you came for than to offer a cookie cutter uh, training that I can tell you exactly what we're going to cover and how and when with a rubric and stuff. Rubric is the bu buzzword of the week um, and the lack thereof that EDGE doesn't have one. The reason EDGE doesn't have one is it assesses these are the benchmarks you're going to meet in order to consider you got an A, B, C, D, pass or fail. And outside of not showing up or not staying current with the announcements or not being in the know because you're not looking at Teachable, like outside of that, um, or ghosting and just dropping out, outside of that, like I don't really fail people. Like we will get there together, whatever, whatever that looks like, we will get there together. Um, okay, so if you guys could each just take a moment with those two things in mind, um, I want you to write two things in the chat so that we can all kind of guide through it and, uh, and, and drive this conversation there. And I would like you to write what kind of class you plan on teaching, like whatever you wrote down a few moments ago, if you could share that. If you don't feel comfortable sharing, you don't have to, but it'd be really helpful, um, I think, to build our community if we understand the different walks of life that comes to this, comes to this training. And I can tell you they are vast. Uh, and whether or not you are or are not interested in including Sanskrit in that modality. And again, it's not a right or wrong on that. And I'll just give you a, a couple of minutes to go ahead and do that one for me. I see one, two, three, four of 12 have answered. So I'll give a few more minutes on this. Five of 12.
So we got a few more. So I'll leave about two more minutes. I really do want everyone to take a moment on their why. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. All right. And then just to make sure, can you guys all hear me okay? It's just one person can pop in there. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, all right, so let's go over these reasons, and then we'll continue on with the lesson. So we all kind of know where we're going and what we're headed to. And I can tell you, I came to this uh, for rehab from a disability, power yoga, core strength. So yoga lattes was my jam. Sun salutations was my jam. Didn't care about the rest. And that has so changed over time. So make sure that you tune in, you put your antennas up as much for the styles of yoga that is not included in this list so that you you can move into teaching whatever style uh, you should happen upon as the time goes by. And that's what we aim to do here at EDGE. Uh, all right, so Marcella writes, I want to lead a primarily English-based class sprinkling in Sanskrit. Also, I would like it to be spiritually based, but not religious. That's beautiful. Uh, Jeannie, uh, is it Jeannie or Jean? Do I pronounce the A? Just type in, in chat if I pronounce the A. A is silent or A is, is enunciated. Uh, mainly a spiritual based Eastern class while still presenting it in a way in which people who are more interested in just the movements can follow and connect with. I definitely want to use Sanskrit. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, okay, Steph. I'm thinking I'd like light hybrid, mostly, mostly fitness-based, possibly a bit of Sanskrit. If there's a spiritual experience, it comes from the physical practice. Okay. Dennis, I would include it when possible. I plan to use yoga with my CrossFit athletes for increased body awareness. Love. Marcella, I would like to lead slow flow vinyasa hatha in restorative classes. Not all to start but over time love that grace i want to lead a spiritually deep spiritually based deep fun authentic class in english and possibly spanish sprinkling in sanskrit would love to see you do that joey i teach infused classes lead a story in sanskrit and then teach a peak pose sanskrit name that's a really great approach i think that's a cake you need it too uh, gold star. Okay, Mina, I teach for health and fitness at health clubs currently, and I am looking to continue on this journey. I'm looking to share more Sanskrit in my practice as I would any other teachable moments throughout the class. 
I like the idea of sharing yoga practice that encompasses all eight limbs for students when they are on the mat and when they can carry on in life off their mat. And that's a big takeaway. How can we teach them to take this when they roll up their mat and head on out to live yoga for the rest of the week? Beautiful. Otherwise, we're a yogi for 60 minutes a week. Huh? Uh, Melissa. I like to lead a gentle vinyasa with focus more on spirituality and self-awareness. I love to focus on more of the meditative and self-healing aspects of yoga. I'm huge on breath work in my classes. Ooh, I'd love to see you chime in for that breath work piece. I know that's something people want more of. And uh, for you personally, you may want to head on over to the Edge Yoga School Facebook page and keep an eye on Yamadi's lessons, which are now also posted at the 300 level. So you can get those. As she posts them, I post them in Teachable for you guys. Uh, but that's her jam for sure. Sujana, I would like to lead a power yoga with traditional yoga poses, which I would explain in English as well in Sanskrit. That's, that's nice doing both. Olena, I'd like to teach a vinyasa flow class using English as a primary language, but once in a while to incorporate Sanskrit. That works, that works. And Jeannie like in Jeannie. Thank you, Jeannie. Uh, okay, so let's move on. Uh, just to give you an overview of what these lessons with Jen are going to look like on Sundays and Wednesday nights, um, we're going to open with a yoga sutra and then chit-chat about it a little bit. So if you haven't ordered a copy of Yoga Sutras, you know, don't feel stressed about it, but you might want to. Um, I do believe they have the sutras on Audible or, or a, um, a narrative of, uh, or you can just follow along with what we post because we will be posting what the sutra is. And so talking about the, the sutras is, is really essential, I think, in um, understanding how can we take little excerpts and apply them to daily life. So most of you have said that you would like to see some element of the Eastern side, um, and most of you have said that you'd like to see the Sanskrit there. So it's, it's nice to learn a language in palatable bits. I know that there are on edX, um, there's free courses. I think Rosetta Stone open up courses. There's so many courses out there. We will be offering this at Edge, and it is something where you go to it and you go back to it and you go back to it again. I do personally tell my trainers, if you're not sure how to pronounce it, please don't pronounce it in training um, because we're going to be teaching. We want you guys to trust the information you receive. So as trainers, there's that. So there's just a caveat on the course. Um, so going back to the Yoga Sutra, Sutra translates to thread. So if you want to jot that down, you can. Um, and if you, if you are of the Christian faith, you, in the Bible, you would find the uh, parables. Right, that Jesus would mention. It's a similar kind of idea. And what's fascinating about it is every, I took a world religions class back, back in, uh, I think in my 19, 18 years old or something, and I found it so fascinating. And the big takeaway of my world religions class was most world religions are kind of saying the same thing, but they may have a different deity or they may not have a deity at all, it's just Buddhism. But the, the ideas and the concepts are very similar and the sharings are very similar. And not unlike our anatomy course with Kamenov, we have these broad strokes and then we also have these granular, deep, deep, deep learning pieces. And it's the same thing here. So if we, if we come to the sutras and you get your Yoga Sutras book, or you can even Google them, or you can just get the ones that we feed you as this course goes through. The idea is then to take those sutras and how do I apply this idea, this broad strokes idea, to my life today. So I think it's Sunday. So today on Sunday, have the chosen sutra, apply that one thing today. I think that that's the big takeaway. And for my fitness gurus in the room here on this call, um, we know that that true um, health changes and um, transformations occur by small, consistent daily habits. 
and that's what equates to X, whatever you're going for, weight loss, muscle gain, strength, whatever it might be. It's that daily routine. So the Yoga Sutras, my invitation to you, and it's not required, um, but my invitation to you would be to get the sutras and, you know, look at one a day and just spend five minutes of your day considering or contemplating this sutra. And if you're if you're a journaler and that's your jam, the pull at your terminal and allow that to be a writing prompt for you. And that's something you're going to start to see threaded into this course now that we've officially hit the May 1st mark. Uh, so a little bit more structure on those. I hope you're excited about that. Uh, another thing that you can start to see is we'll be outlining the, uh, outlining the eight limbs of yoga, which again, we're going to see again and again presented by different members of our training team and allowing you to pick your truths there. They're written by Patanjali. So if you open up the Yoga Sutras, you're going to start to see the outline of the eight limbs of yoga. You're going to start to see these broad strokes ideas on these threads and these daily life teachings. And if you take nothing away from this course at all outside of how to be in Shavasana and how to take a comfortable asana for meditation and the Yoga Sutras, I'd still be happy. Um, okay, and what it basically does is they offer guidelines for living a meaningful life. And I think that most folks want that. They mo they mo most folks want a meaningful life more than the structured um, mundane of alarm clock goes off and then the schedule they're on. Okay, so uh, hopefully you guys can take a little bit away on Yoga Sutras for that. Our next lesson is Ancient Eastern Yoga. And this is rarely focused on asana. You know, I think I said in the opening that the idea of yoga is to connect with God. And so some folks still scribe to that present day. But as I've read out your purposes as teachers, this is primarily what we see, at least in the West. And um, word has it that not that many people even in India are excited about doing yoga um, because they were required to do yoga in school growing up. And I'm never speaking about everybody always. I'm usually speaking about the masses most of the time. So disclaimer there. But y you might find that that's up there with us um, that did square dancing or kickball in gym class wanting to then spend our life doing that. Most of us don't. There's an element of resistance there. So that's a fun thing that you can dive into if you want to know more about. But again, rarely focused on asana. Uh, we focus more on pranayama, dharana, nada, and do not have fitness as the main objective. So get fit so that you can bench more wasn't really part of it. But I think most of you guys know that. That pranayama piece, um, that life force piece, that's Yamadi's jam, catch our Facebook Live. So if you're not in the 300-hour program and you don't have access to Yamadi's um, recordings, you can catch them on Facebook at Ed Yoga School. So she's an admin there, and she jumps on, and she delivers her lessons there. And we might find a dog or a baby in the background, and that's okay, right? Because Yamadi is such a wealth of information. I gave her a pass on that, and I said, just come and share what you know as best you can. And if a dog barks or a baby cries, then that's fine. Uh, so just so you know. So that prana, Yama piece, that, that prana, that life is, is what that means. Uh, dharana, you know, we talked about dharana and we talk about dhyana and the difference of the two. And these are lessons in their own right, but just to touch on them for the purpose of this is dharana is concentration. So let's say we are in a yoga class and I'm playing the gong for you, which is something I commonly do. Then I'm inviting you to concentrate on the gong. This is different than dhyana, which is true meditation, and that is not shutting the mind off by any means. It's often considered that, but it's not. It's really, um, it's more allowing, uh, let's say for the lack of a, a different term, allowing for a download. You know, and many people feel that way, that, uh, that we have such clarity of thought, such singularity 
of presence that the monologue in our mind is tamed and that might even show up in Durana. I'm playing the gong. You might be thinking, oh my gosh, I love this. I need a gong. I want to learn how to play, right? Like there's still dialogue within your mind. It, it's good, but it's, it's what we truly see in most classes. Um, I think around the world, I wouldn't even say in the West, but I would say around the world we see in most classes Durana, not actually Diana. So we do say that we're going to have yoga and meditation, but really what we're doing is yoga and concentration, and that's okay. Uh, so again, bringing in that element of sound, that, that's such uh, like ohms, the frequency, the chanting, Again, if you touch on the different world religions, um, I invite you to maybe, maybe, maybe take world religions from a lens of unity in that most world religions are trying to accomplish the same thing. And we tend to get in trouble when we end up tripping into an extreme edge of ideas. So I'll just set that down right there for you. And fitness isn't there. But again, so even let's take a Buddhist monk who sits, um, and not all Buddhist monks do this, by the way, but let's say we have a Buddhist monk who aspires to sit for several hours of meditation per day. There, there's a certain level of athleticism that that requires, you know, core strength, flexibility through the hips. At some point, you have to know that low back is just going to start killing you, right? Like, think about the human element of this. A, a Buddhist monk still carries this human body, just like you and I do. So thinking about that, so it wasn't until asana started surfacing more when hatha yoga came to be. It presents it as hatha yoga, and if if you if you go to the gym and you look at the schedule, and even I know Steph did the other day styles of yoga, and people were talking about hatha yoga versus vinyasa flow, for example. And I did mention at that moment that let's remember that hatha yoga, the word hatha yoga has changed in meaning over time from it was basically all asana to now it's a style. And that's okay. All we're trying to do is share ideas. And it doesn't matter if we make words up to do that. And I have done that. You are, you are, you're witnessing that in the manual in the yoga snippets, the warrior dance, for example. If I say to you, uh, hey, Maricela, could you demonstrate warrior dance? You're then able to do that, hopefully, after this training is through. I mean, that's just something I made up, right? That's just a term I coined. I identified an idea could more easily be shared when named and communicated to my audience and received and understood. And that's all we're looking to do here. Um, and I mention this because sometimes um, yogis with different purpose, as many of you have, um, can kind of come to it. And, and, and it does show up a bit as ego, is this is right and that is wrong. And this is where I'm saying, as long as we're communicating, we can make words up. It doesn't really matter. We do want to know, for credibility's sake, what the actual um, – uh, historical viewpoints are commonly or widely accepted, uh, but even then, I don't know if you could hand me a book that I myself would say I scribe this as truth, you know, because it's still written by the author. Uh, you know, just kind of touching on, I don't watch the news. I watch the press release. I'll watch the press release and I'll deduce how I feel about it and I'll make up my own mind and I'll draw my own conclusions and then I shut it off. And this is kind of like that. Whenever you read a text, no matter how credible the author may be, it will still be with the influence of their experience and their truth and their lens. So there's that. Um, so, okay, so in the early decades of the 20th century, physical yoga was taught as a possible defense mechanism against the threat of potential colonization, meaning stronger bodies equal stronger warriors. So let's just kind of touching on, you know, yogis are passive hippies that get run over, um, false. Yogis are warriors. But I, I think the difference is, um, in my lifetime, I know I've personally experienced the difference between loud and aggressive versus silent and assertive. You know, I think there's something there, and I'm finding that as my personal decades go by, I'm needing less words to um, meet what it is I need done uh, as a warrior within.
right? And that does not, for me personally, equate to screaming and yelling. Um, sadly, though, there are some relationships in our lives that might, you don't get the results you want unless you scream and yell. And I've seen that too. Um, and I've and I've done that too. I've screamed and yelled with the best of them. I'm really good at it. I can usually get my way. But at the end of that, I think I've given away a piece of myself that I'm not willing to do anymore. So if a relationship requires screaming and yelling, chances are I vote that's a toxic relation by my own definition, and I'm out. So you you do what you want with that. Um, there are from there then there's there's different styles of yoga that has popped up. Um, and in even the Indian government, which encouraged um, these teachings and, and such for the purpose of athleticism and physical strength. And this is where we start to see like more gymnastics and things along those lines. So I hope that helps you understand that to take an asan is to take a comfortable seat. So when we all get together, you can have a, a friend over and say, take an asan. And that means just take a seat. It doesn't mean take a tricky arm balance. It can, if that's how you define it. Uh, all right, so translates to a comfortable seat. Today, it is also used to describe all yoga poses. So again, whether you use the word poses or postures or asana or asan or, or, or make a word up or find a different word out there for it, that's okay as long as you're sharing the idea, right? And so we are part of history. We are part of making history and creating what yoga is. And one day, <clears throat> Hopefully, they'll look back and they'll say, wow, that edge cohort, they came up with X, you know, whatever, fill in the blank, whatever it is. So bringing us to modern yoga. So it began, and, and, and there's more uh, on these lessons that Jen will start to talk about, about the pre-classical and the classical and uh, the Vedas and all of that. But for today, it's just an overview of what you can start to expect. So your modern yoga began in the 20s and 30s in India and spread to the West, uh, like wildfire, really. The first group of yogi pioneers focused on pranayama meditation and positive thinking. So commonly you'll see in my yoga teacher trainings, I'm threading in motivational speaking, and this is from that. Um, I believe that there's a space there. I believe that um, for those of you that haven't seen, we have our book club starting on May 15th, and the book I chose is The Mindset Coach. And if you get it on Audible, you get these nice PDFs that go with, with that. I also posted it in, in Slack. But I think, again, that's a nice way to – and you earn hours for this training because of this um, – I think it's a nice way to lend towards waking up in the morning, taking in a sauna for five minutes, not turning on your phone yet, and maybe just doing a little pranayama breath breath is your personal practice. Maybe you take a personal practice that includes uh, a sauna. Maybe you don't. Having a mindful movement and then integrating, maybe you read a, a yoga sutra and then maybe you integrate that into these lessons that we pick up on the Mindset Coach. And the reason I feel like Mindset Coach is so good, although it really is aimed at um, teachers teaching, um, you know, K through 12, and so on, I feel like these same teachings can help us, A, be better students because we're students before we are teachers. I am your student before I am your teacher. And if you can learn that, you'll learn so much from this and so on. Uh, so I hope that this helps. Um, so we start to then see different lineages pop up. You know, largely we have uh, Iyengar throughout the majority majority of studios in this country. Um, this is what most of it looks like. There are other people. Um, this this training you guys are getting from me is more slanted from Deska Char in that uh, Leslie Kamenoff was Deska Char's student. And I am teaching you in this particular training so much anatomy, and that's coming from Kamenoff, which came from Deskachar. So there's there's an there's an innate lineage that's um, infused into a into a teacher's teachings, and so I think the um, the big piece of it is for you to decide 
where you want to start and give yourself permission to change that later. Like, this is where I am now. This is where I seem to want to be. Um, this has been a consistent thing throughout. I've wanted to understand how do we make for a healthier body so we can have a healthier mind, so that we can have healthier relationships, so that I can change the world, which is what I aim to do. So that's what I'm trying for. Uh, you might find a teacher training that you might have stumbled into that was largely Asana-based and really, really talking about where the foot goes at 45 or 90 degrees and so on. And again, that's going to go back to that lineage. You know, we got Patabi Joyce and so on. Um, for my goddess sisters out there, I'd love to start to see more from Shiva Ray. So I'll probably do, I'll probably do a book club on that and not to exclude my guy my guy pals because I hope that you guys come and you integrate so that you can understand your female audience in that way um, but in that you know women weren't even allowed to practice yoga much less be teachers of it so I'd like to see a surge of teachings from Shiva Ray so if you haven't already take a pen and paper write down moon salutations and google it and play it on YouTube and from time to time I will play that for you I would post a link right now, but I'm on my phone, I'm reading notes, and I've got Ellie in my passenger seat, so I can't. We've got a play date today. Uh, all right, so then who created what and so on, you'll be getting that from Jen. Uh, the next piece, then we start to see Ashtanga Yoga, American Vinyasa, Power Vinyasa. And, and so now we start to see that work out thing. This can be moving meditation. This can be prayer. This can be connection with God. This shows up in 108 sun salutations. If you didn't join 100 sun salutations yet, make sure you catch one with me or with someone else. We'll be doing it, um, and it's often offered in the fall for charity. I'm actually kind of playing around with could we do a Zoom event as the Edge team for charity of some sort um, then. So, again, it has its purpose. Everything has its place. And different people come for different reasons, and that's why I asked you all to share what your reasons were there. Uh, Ashtanga yoga, by default, isn't something I teach as much at the studio in general because in its most traditional form, we have a place for the foot to go. And I don't know that Michelle subscribes with that. Michelle falls under the Desca Char lineage who's looking for where would your foot have to go in order to have your shoulders and hips facing forward in a natural neutral way, not, not so much as headlights would because most of our bodies don't do that, right? And engaging the core, like where would it have to go to have an extension of the hip flexor of that right foot and a strength through the left quad, right? So as such, you're not going to hear from me where I want you to put your foot. You're going to hear me ask you, where does your foot need to go to have that happen? And that isn't as much, generally speaking, Ashtanga based. So kind of going back to that, and we will get into that again. We have a change of word meaning here as we do with Hatha in both cases in both cases of Ashtanga and uh, Hatha Yoga. So we'll, we'll touch on that as time goes by. Uh, okay, so continuing on. So when do women come into yoga? Uh, classical yoga was male only practice until the first lady of yoga, Idra Devi was accepted to study circa 1937 or so, uh, it took a while. You know, it took a while to get women at the front of the room, which is why it's so intriguing to me that women, for the most part, percentage-wise, are the majority practicing yoga, although more and more as every day passes, we see more men as teachers, as students, and even on this training, which delights me. Fun fact, when I started off, I started off as Salutations Yoga, and my, um, my logo was a pink and black flower. So if you, if you Google Salutations Yoga, a bunch of stuff is going to come up. I, I operated there for a long time, but the reason I made the shift is one, I outgrew only salutations as a teacher. So pick a name and pick a brand that you can grow into. 
and two, I felt it was exclusive um, to to only women and excluded men, and I aim to include everybody. So if you're human or or are interested in being human, you're invited to this training. And, and, you know, as long as everybody observes their eight limbs and so on and their yamas and niyamas in our courses, all are welcome. And so there's not a vetting process in that way. Uh, okay, so a couple questions in our last 10 minutes, and I want you guys to answer, because, well, quite frankly, I'm getting tired of being the only one talking here. So the first question for you is, is present day yoga still authentic? What do you guys think? And I'm going to jump on the chat, so I'm going to jump off. Is present day yoga still authentic? What do we think? I'll wait to give you guys a moment to answer. Oh, there's a must be good. Ellie kisses, kisses, kisses. Oh. Are you there? Okay, good. Yep, yep, yep. Keep typing, keep typing. I want everyone in. The downside of the, the chat is I don't want people to um, wander off. <laughs> Keep going. And there is no right or wrong. I'm not going to say, you you fail yoga school. You didn't get this right. You know, I think what we're trying to do here is celebrate the different points of view. All right. So... Who thinks it should be called something else? Should it be called something else? Should we call it not yoga? Should we call it something else? That's something you'll hear brought up in, in the industry, in the business. That's all answer. Should it be called something else? Everyone? Okay. I'm loving the different diverse answers. I, you know, that's, that's so, that's so, where is that? Uh, okay. I think it can be authentic to you, your own soul growth or physical journey. Yes. I think if you teach from a place that, wait, did I jump up? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think if you teach from a place that is authentic, then yes, it's authentic to who you are. Yes. Yes, it is more of a fusion. Yes, I think it depends on the class, the teacher, and the perspective of the teacher. Yes, it's personal. I feel like it's what you make of it. Yes, I think it's more authentic to the times and much more inclusive overall as a practice with the diversity of styles, forms, etc. Yes, actually, as it grows, the more authentic I find it to be. Uh, yep, still yoga. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, nope. Well, there are so many variations. Paya. So this is all the different styles of yoga. And we'll touch on that when we go over um, the yoga poster. So if you haven't ordered your yoga poster.com, I recommend yoga poster.com. It's cool. Uh, yoga means to unite, to come together. So as long as you are coming together in a purpose to raise your vibration and spiritual growth, then it can still be called yoga. Yes. I think that allows people to connect to their intuition or their divine inspiration and become integrated, then yes, I think it's fine to call it yoga. Yes. Uh, yoga has its origin, and then it's up to you as student teacher to take it where you want to go. Yes. I think not because it's still yoga, but each can find something to follow and deepen it. Yes. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, okay, next question. How different would it be if we still practiced 
ancient Eastern yoga. And since we only have five minutes, I just want you to write that one down and perhaps journal on it. I'll award you hours in good faith that you do this assignment. But I don't want to be tackled about a bunch of questions on hours when I extend these opportunities. Otherwise, I become shy on extending said opportunities. How would it be if we still practice ancient Eastern yoga? I'll even type it in. Okay. I do want you to answer this question, though. Is it yes or a no, or maybe there's something in between with four minutes to go? Would it be as popular? I do want everyone to chime in on some level. Oh, my big girl, Ellie, Ellie, Ellie. Would it be as popular? So I'd love for everyone to chime in. Okay. So, you know, as you see, uh, I think that that's the beauty of it. When folks are like, yoga isn't even yoga anymore. Yoga's dead. And now it's all about Lululemon and headstands and balance poses and Instagram. And I think that's false. I think that the the growth mindset, um, which is that, that book we're doing, The Growth Mindset Coach. I think I just said The Mindset Coach for it. The Growth Mindset Coach. Um, there's another book called Mindset, which is also amazing. I read years ago, but this is the Growth Mindset Coach, and it talks about, you know, if if we can have a growth mindset that there is no right or wrong, that all really is possible. So I advise you to take this training from that place, uh, and I think that it'll be a much more joyous experience for you as well, because as you get to know me, not only as your teacher, but as a human, you're going to find that um, you know, it, these things we do are invitations to explore your own truth more than they are, you know, answers to questions, which is why I don't really, you know, questions aren't my jam. And, um, you know, you guys all know that now, I would guess. And it's really more, you know, well, what do you think, you know? And what's your truth? And I'm still going to be ending up back with Kamenoff to make sure that we have um, nice anatomical alignment to reduce the chance of injury. So that's going to be my answer. If anything, I'm going to tell you to open up what page in uh, Kamenoff's book if you want to know where to put the foot. Okay, so with that then, uh, what is the draw for your for others or yourself to modern Western yoga? One minute to go. So again, you can journal on it. I'll type this. And in closing, I, I will say that it, it, would, it would have something to do with meet the people where they are, you know, meet the people where they are. So when my practitioners come to me looking to advance their personal asana practice, I suggest that they enroll, we, we have licensed, Ed Yoga has a relationship with Kamenoff 
and that we have license to their um, whole anatomy course, the yoga fundamentals uh, at a reduced rate. It's seven ninety nine dollars uh, normally if you're not in our 200 or 300, but otherwise it's three forty nine dollars if you want that course. And I will tell you, you get into the nitty gritty there with them on that one. And it does satisfy some of your hours. So if you're interested in that, please send me a message via Slack. Uh, so with that, it's 2 o'clock. I hope you guys have enjoyed this lesson. It's been delightful sharing it with you. I hope you're looking forward to Sundays and Wednesdays coming up. Um, I'm, I'm kind of I'm flirting with the idea of moving from 7 to 9 to instead guided 6 to 8 with study hall 8 to 9 because some folks have expressed it's kind of getting late and they start to drop off, which is something I didn't really anticipate. All I was doing is trying to mirror my studio schedule online as much as possible. Um, so still keeping it to nine, but maybe the guiding will go from six to eight. And then those that want to stick around and work on their workbooks or whatever from um, eight to nine might do that. So that's that's that if you're looking for that. So um, Sunday will be more delivery based, whereas um, Wednesday will be more implemental based. So with that, namaste, everybody. Thank you all for joining me. It's always so delightful to see the participants that come and continue to show up and, and share their yoga practice with me. So with that, namaste. Namaste, 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 everybody. You are also very welcome. And remember, anything I've said to do is simply my truth. And if you believe something different, I hold space for that. And that's completely okay. I do not pretend to have all of the answers, only only my own truths, and even they change over time.